First Samuel chapter number 18. We're just going to read a couple verses this morning. Uh, we'll read verse number 28. The Bible says, And Saul saw and knew the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We well, thank you for the good singing, the good choir singing, the good special singing. Thank you for a good Sunday school hour. Lord, thank you for the good report of the two jail services this morning. God, thank you for being a good God. Now, I pray you'd help us, Lord. We need your help. We're needy people. We live in a perverse and wicked generation. God, we pray that, God, you would help us this morning. You'd manifest yourself here in the service and manifest yourself to our hearts. God, I pray that, Lord, you would encourage and edify your people. Lord, instruct them in the ways of righteousness. And certainly, Lord, help them to realize the blessings we have in the Lord Jesus Father, I do pray, as Brother Ron's prayed, if there's any amongst us today that has never been saved, never been born again, Lord, they've never been to Calvary, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Now, Father, I pray you'd bless, you'd touch hearts, and you'd glorify your namesake. Use this unworthy vessel now, Father. We'll thank you for it, for it's in the wonderful and the holy name of the Lord Jesus we ask it all. Amen. And amen. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, you find the great account of David versus Goliath. And what a tremendous uh, uh, illustration of how big our God is. Goliath was nine feet, three inches tall. And David was just but a lad. And yet, David's God was a lot bigger than that giant that he faced. Amen. David said, you come to me with spirit and sword. I come to you in the name of the Lord. Uh, and David ran to the battle. You say, there's something wrong with that guy that he'd run to a giant. Uh, uh, there was somebody behind David a lot bigger than the giant. Uh, and David was tired of hearing that fella cuss God uh, and cuss the armies of God. And he said, I'm going to settle this thing right now. Uh, and David uh, let that stone go from that sling uh, and it hit that giant, the only place it didn't have any armor, in the forehead. Uh, and if you read the scripture, the giant didn't fall backwards, but fell forwards. Uh, uh, you never hit somebody in the head and they fall backwards. Uh, why did that happen? Because God smote the giant from behind. Uh, then David took the giant's sword uh, and took his head off with his own sword. Uh, and that day, mm, the Israelites uh, slew a lot of Philistines. And the Philistines ran because their champion went down. I've got good news. Our champion's never going down. His name is Jesus. Uh, but as a result of that great day, David becomes the champion of Israel. And there's many battles that ensued after that, Brother Bob. Uh, and when they'd come in from the battles, Brother Ron, uh, the people would cry to Saul the king. Saul has his thousands but David, his tens of thousands, and David became so popular. You see, Saul had already turned his heart from God, and God had already anointed David the next king. And Saul became very jealous of David. Matter of fact, in chapter number 18, Saul has two plots to kill David. Wants him out of the way. Hmm? You see... Uh, uh, it seems like it's been a popular thing throughout uh, uh, the ages. If you have an opponent that you're afraid of, you need to dig up everything you can on them and get rid of them. Hmm? Uh, some of you will get that. Hmm? Uh, I mean, uh, poor Donald Trump for about seven years has had to face every kind of lie and scrutiny in the world, and they can't find anything on him. They just keep making stuff up, huh? Uh, by the way, they did co uh, come out yesterday and admitted those files they took pictures of they supposedly got out of his home in Florida. They were empty. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you won't find that on CNN. Uh, but anyway, that didn't cost you anything extra. 
um, Saul has a purpose in his heart to plot against David. And right before our reading, uh, he uh, 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 is going to offer his daughter to marry David in hopes that he can gain some more information on David. Uh, and he also sends a plot uh, for David to go out in the midst of the Philistines in hopes that uh, the Philistines kill him. Hmm? Yeah. Only for David to once again be victorious. And only for David, uh, only for Saul to find out that his daughter actually falls in love with David. Yeah. Hmm? So, uh, with that in mind, let's look at these two verses. I want you to notice, first of all, uh, the father was with David. Look what it says, verse 28. And Saul, Saul, that's hard to say, and knew that the Lord was with David. Can I say, the apostle Paul wrote that if God be for us, who could be against us? Because right. see, when you're fighting against somebody that God's for, you're actually fighting against God. Yep, yep. And nobody's ever fought against God and won. Right. And so Saul uh, realizes he's in trouble when he notices the Lord's with David. Hmm? Can I say, uh, the Bible made it real clear you're not to touch the anointed of God. In God's hands on David, we see the father was with David. I want you to notice the fear that Saul had for David. Look what it said in verse 29. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David. Hmm? Now, can I say David has never given Saul any cause to be afraid of him? As a matter of fact, there's times when Saul couldn't go to sleep and David get his heart and go in there and sing to him until he went to sleep. David took out the champion that Saul was afraid to fight. David had done nothing but honored Saul throughout his entire life. And yet, Saul becomes the more afraid of David. We see the father was with David. We see the fear that Saul had for David. But notice the foe that Saul became to David. Look what it says. And Saul became David's enemy continually. Let me just say this. Fear will cause you to be turned into a foe. Yep. Amen. Mm. I've seen that happen in, in ministry. I've seen one fella get jealous of another preacher, and then he began to fear that preacher, Brother Brian, only to make that preacher his enemy. I want to tell you something. Uh, Christians should never be at odds with one another. We're all in the same battle. Hmm? Uh, but yet there's some preachers that have a little problem. Same problem Saul had. It's a green-eyed monster called jealousy. Hmm? Uh, there's no room for jealousy in the ministry. All the glory is supposed to go to Jesus, right. not to man. But I read that last phrase of verse 29, and Saul became David's enemy continually. And this is what I want to preach on for just a few minutes this morning. I want to preach on continual enemies to the child of God. You see, a lot of times we listen to mainstream popular uh, so-called preachers where every day is going to be a Friday and something good's going to happen to you today. Uh, right when we was down there in Georgia, I, I saw this commercial come up where uh, this guy will send you some little holy water out of some spring in Jerusalem uh, and you're going to get a check for $10,000 in the mail the next day. What a blessing. Uh, I, I, and people have uh, listened to this stuff and bought into this stuff uh, and they uh, have failed to realize that, uh, friend, uh, the Christian life is not a love fest, even though we love Jesus because he first loved us, uh, but the Christian life is a battlefield. Uh, we are constantly uh, in a battle uh, against the flesh, against the world, uh, against the sorry devil. We are constantly in a battle, uh, and it's time we get that mindset again. But whether or not you realize it, you've got some enemies. You've got some external enemies. Amen. But more importantly, you've got some internal enemies. And I want to preach on these continual enemies, things you're going to have to deal with until Jesus calls you home. Hmm? We don't like to think in these terms. Um, but we have 
things that are contrary to what the Spirit of God wants to do in our lives. Can I say, first of all, we have the enemy of dread, better known as fear. Well, we'd like to say that we are not afraid of anything, but then you'd be lying in the house of God. There is something that you're afraid of. And then you can be like me and have a phobia of snakes. Hmm? Huh? Miss Net, we're down there, and, and right down there where uh, Brother Stacy's church is, they, they have uh, a national forest, and, and they're known for these falls, and and so we went to see these falls, and, and these falls were beautiful. I mean, it, it, it topped anything I'd seen in Hawaii. I mean, they say it's, uh, Miss Sydney read that it was taller than Niagara Falls, uh, and this fall was, it was beautiful. And we walked down this path, went down there, and, and looked at the, the, the falls, and the path was all nice crushed gravel, and everything was done real nice and everything. We're looking at the falls, and then my mind is directed to a sign. It said, this is a natural habitat. Be, be watchful for snakes. I'm thinking, it's time to leave the falls. <laughs> I've seen all the falls I care to see today. Hmm? Uh, Sydney's uh, 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 working. Isn't it a blessing to be able to have your computer? She's sitting there on a... She had to sit down and type something on her computer there at the falls. And everything. she's sitting down. And Miss Nett's uh, 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 sitting down over there and everything. And I'm saying, no, I ain't sitting down. There might be a snake around here. I ain't sitting nowhere... I need to be ready to run, huh? There's one thing to have a phobia of snakes. I was good till I was 15 and, and grabbed what I thought was a rubber one, and it wasn't rubber. That's when I got my phobia, huh? You know, <laughs> that changed my life forever, trust me, huh? I forced myself going to reptile house at the zoo. I got to man up. I got to pull out my best John Wayne and go into the zoo to see the reptile house, you know? And they're behind glass. But when they move, oh, I get the woolly boogers. But anyway, it's one thing to have that, some kind of natural fear. But the fear I'm talking about is those things that cause you to distrust God. You see, God's given us in His Word everything we need to trust Him. But yet there are forces that come against us to cause us not to trust Him. Right. Now, you can think that you're Superman, but let me help you. I'm about ready to turn 59. Uh, the older I get, the more natural fears we face. There's that natural fear that we can't do what we once did. It's not that we don't want to. We just can't. I don't know why I'm looking at you. Colonel Sanders, huh? But you know yourself, there's, there's things that you would like to do, and you're going to find out. Yeah, no, you ain't. Not with biceps like that, you ain't there. Trust me, huh? Huh? The older you get, the more the realization is you've lived longer than you've got ahead of you. And even though you're ready to go to heaven, you're not ready to go right now. Right. Amen. Mm. Uh, uh, told Miss Veronica this morning, I says, good to see you. She says, it's good to be seen. I said, it's better to be seen than viewed. Some of you get that. Uh, but there are some natural fears that come in our life that will cause us to be hesitant to follow the Lord. Amen. Mm, you know, when you're young, you haven't experienced much, you're ready to charge hell with a water pistol. Right. You get a little age on you, you realize when you charge hell, sometimes hell spits back. Oh, yeah, man. Mm? Oh, yeah. And you find out that you're not as quick to run to those battles like David was when he faced Goliath. Right. You say, oh, David wasn't afraid of anything. How come in the next chapter you find him fleeing Saul? Yeah. Mm. That's good. There are things that will cause you to fear the trusting hand of the Lord. Uh, and that's an enemy because we're to trust the Lord always. We're not to lean on our own understanding, but we're to trust in the Lord. Uh, and that's not always easy and it becomes an enemy. There's a conflict. There's a battle. You've got to lay aside what is natural in your thinking to trust in the unseen hand of God. 
And I say dread is an enemy that you'll deal with continually. Hmm? Where, where, where are you at, Fred? See, right now, the only thing you're really afraid of is that linebacker blitzing and not getting blocked, and that little sweet thing you want to ask out on a date tells you no. That's the only thing you're afraid of. <laughs> it's going to change, son. No. There's a lot of things in the future. Because when that one little sweet thing in the future says yes, and you put a ring on her finger, you're going to learn to fear a whole lot of things. <laughs> huh? Yeah, tell it hmm? is. You'll learn. Huh? <laughs> yeah. He'll learn. Phil don't even have a wife. He's still fearing it. Huh? Listen to him back here. Huh? Tell it. Memory. <laughs> Uh, he didn't say precious memories, did he? How they linger. No, he didn't say that. There's the enemy of dread. You know, it would be nice to get through a service without Phil. But anyway, no, I'm just teasing. I love Brother Phil. I haven't got to listen to his message from Wednesday, but I heard it was good. There's not only the enemy of dread, there's the enemy of doubt. Can I say the first time the devil tempted a human being when he tempted Eve, the whole temptation was for her to doubt what God said. Can I say your whole Christian life, the devil's going to try to get you to doubt what God said. Hmm? We have the great parable of the Lord in chapter 13 of the book of Matthew, the parable of the seed. Uh, and can I say, uh, uh, the fowls of the air came and devoured the seed that fell by the wayside. Uh, and there's four examples of the seed being dropped in the ground, uh, but only one takes root. Uh, and can I say, the fowls of the devil uh, will try and steal the seed of the Word of God away from you, uh, because if the Word of God lodges in your heart, uh, David said, thy word if I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee and without the seed germinating the seed of the word of God germinating in your heart you'll sin against God you'll fail God you'll blow it and that's right where the devil wants you you see when you're full of faith you follow God when you're full of doubt you don't follow God while you're following God not only is your life blessed, but other people see the Lord in you. And they too may choose to follow God. And that's what scares the devil to death. He just wants us to doubt God. When you're in a state of doubt, you are an utter failure of a Christian. Because the Bible says anything that is not of faith is sin. And my dear friends, when you are living in sin, in doubt... You do not have the blessings of God on your life, and God is not pleased with your life. So doubt is an enemy, and it's one of the greatest tools of the devil. Now, I've heard lame brain preachers, I'm talking about Baptist preachers, say that they've never doubted since they got saved. Well, I say they've never been saved. Huh? Because I never doubted until I got saved. Uh, once I got saved, there was doubt entering my life. Hmm? He'll cause you to doubt your salvation. That's why you need to go back to that place where you got saved. Say, devil, you're a liar. Uh, he'll cause you to doubt the will of God for your life. He'll cause you to doubt the scriptures. Uh, he'll cause you to doubt which way to turn when you know where you're going. I mean, he's a doubter. It's what he puts in your life. Amen. And it's an enemy. And I'll say, not only the enemy of dread and doubt, but then there's the enemy of disdain. That's a fancy word for pride. The Bible says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Amen. And so the devil wants to fill you up with pride. Mm? Pride and arrogance. There is nothing more sick, sickening in a child of God than an arrogant child of God. They forgot what garbage dump God found them in. Huh? There's none of us worth the powder to take to blow away. If we all got what we deserve, we'd die and go to hell. Uh, hey, uh, just because somebody treaded out a little deeper in sin than you did doesn't make you any better. Uh, uh, your sin was going to drag you off into hell, uh, and it took the same amount of blood on, uh, shed on Calvary uh, to save you from your sin as it does somebody else's sin. Uh, and who are we uh, uh, to look down on somebody? Huh? Mm. 
But for the grace of God, there goeth I. Mm. But that pride likes to well up, doesn't it? Mm. Uh, especially if we think we're right and somebody else is wrong. Uh, pride. And then arrogance. Oh, there's nothing worse than an arrogant Christian. An arrogant preacher. Uh, arrogant. Uh, it's got an air about it. God help us. But it's an enemy. Because you can be humble for weeks on end, but then in a weak moment, pride fill you up. It's always lurking. It's an enemy. Something you got to battle. Something you got to combat. Uh, by the way, being humble doesn't mean to be a welcome mat where everybody wipes their feet on you. Uh, that's stupid. That ain't humble. Humility is knowing all your strengths and knowing all your weaknesses and abiding therein. Don't try to be something you're not. That's being humble. huh? Listen, uh, if you're smart and somebody says, boy, I, I, I really appreciate your intellect, don't say, well, I'm just an old dumb hillbilly. No, you're not. Now you're a liar. Huh? Just say, well, praise the Lord. I am what I am by the grace of God. Hmm? Uh, give God the praise for how he made you. Now, if you're dumb, don't act like you're smart. As soon as you open your mouth, people are going to know. Huh? Huh? And say, well, I don't like being dumb. Well, read some books. It might help you. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that, Melissa. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Huh? I'm just teasing. Bless her heart. No. You know, I heard if you say bless your heart, you can say anything about anybody as long as you end with bless your heart. I've heard that. Uh you all know the rules. If you sit on the front row, you're liable to get picked on. Well, where I was at in Georgia, they didn't know the rule. <laughs> they figured it out. I didn't realize I must have went by and smacked this guy in the face. You know, kind of like I've done Clint a few times over the years. huh? But he still sits there. huh? His father-in-law said, I wish you'd hit him a little harder. I said he had a glass jaw. He couldn't take it, you know. Huh? But I didn't even realize I did it. But anyway, listen. Disdain is an enemy that we'll deal with. Another enemy that I see affecting a lot of God's people, the enemy of dormancy, where we're dormant. Amen. We become lethargic, complacent, self-satisfied. Hmm? Listen, you haven't arrived yet. You don't have a halo. Huh? Uh, none of us have arrived and the day we do arrive brother Brian is when we get to go to heaven and all the while leading up to that the Lord's working on us you do know that uh, but listen there's nowhere in the scriptures where I find you get to a point in your Christian life where you can just sit down kick back and do nothing right. we're to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Growing is a progressive word. Doesn't mean you just get there and stop. It means you keep growing. It amazes me. Uh, I've been studying this Bible for 48 years, and the more I learn, the more I realize I need to know. And I can open it in any given section, begin to read, and I'll see something and learn something I never knew before. Because this book's alive. Because the Lord Jesus is alive. Yep. Amen. He's the living word, and this is the written word. It just tells us what we need to know about him. But uh, there are folks that get lethargic. They just quit paying the price and quit serving the Lord. They get the mindset that coming and sitting down on the church pew is service. No, this is worship. Service happens outside these walls. And if, if you're still breathing God's air, He still has something for you to do. Amen. Mm. Uh, so when you become dormant, you're not allowing God to work through your life. And you're right where the devil wants you. Mm. The reason we have to have revival meetings is because we've gotten unrevived. You get unrevived when you get satisfied with where you are. Amen. And so don't get dormant. That's an enemy. Mm-mm. 
I'm waiting for the Lord to give me liberty to preach the second uh, installment of the Tao message. I preached it down there last Sunday for the first time. And uh, I basically just asked them if they still had their towel. And they just kind of looked at me and said, well, if you did, I wouldn't have to be here right now. Hmm? So uh, keep your towel, and I won't have to pre preach that message around here, all right? Another enemy that the child of God has to deal with is division. See, the Spirit of God is about unity and unifying. He unifies the sinner to the Savior. But then after we get saved, He wants us to live in a state of unity. Amen. How good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Where there is no unity, there is no unction, no movement or power of the Holy Spirit. So we have to be unified. We've got to have the same goals and same desires. Uh, and that is born in us through the Spirit of God. Uh, and what the devil do, does to combat that is to divide us. All of a sudden, if Brother James is pulling that way, and Brother Phil's pulling that way, we don't have unity. we got conflict. And what hurts a lot of churches is you got a lot of folks that want their agenda to be the agenda. Well, there's only one agenda around here. It's the Lord Jesus, what He wants. And when we're all moving in the right direction, God does great things. But when there's division, we get problems. When all of a sudden Miss Mary becomes at odds against Miss Cinda over something that they had in their childhood 400 years ago on Mary's account. Uh, and she keeps bringing that up and allows that thing to build a wedge between them. There can't be unity. That's what the devil wants to do. He wants to build wedges. I wish it was plausible, but it isn't plausible. But wouldn't it be wonderful if there wasn't any aisles in the church house? Huh? We'd all be in one place. Of course, it'd take forever to get out the pews, to get out the building and all that. Now, I know why we have aisles, but there seems like sometimes the devil put divisions right between aisles. Uh, I've heard people say, if you don't sit on the left side, you're not on the right side. Duh. Huh? Only the people that sit on the right side are right with God. Yeah, exactly. Division is an enemy we've got to fight. Because all of a sudden, the devil will have you picking out faults of somebody else without looking at your own faults. Amen. And then all of a sudden, you'll find disdain for that person because you got prideful and arrogant, and then we're in a mess. I'm almost done, but I'm trying to give you some enemies you're going to deal with continually. Hmm. Say, preacher, how do we deal with them? You keep your nose in the Bible. Yeah. You keep your knees bent in prayer. And you keep your eyes on Jesus. Hey. You do those things, and a lot of these enemies will be suppressed. But all you have to do is quit reading, quit praying, quit looking at Jesus, and these enemies will overtake you. Amen. Hmm. Just like being a soldier on a battlefield, you wouldn't want to go out there without your, without your equipment, your armor, and your rifle, and all those things. Well, when we're unequipped, the enemy overtakes us. Another enemy that I find affects people is double-mindedness. James 1.8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. James 4, 8 says, Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. In order for James to pin it down twice must be important. Double-mindedness is where on Sunday you live for the Lord, but on Monday you live for the world. Mm? Uh, it's called hypocrisy. Mm? Or when you're around church folks, you act real churchy, but when you're not around them, you act worldly. Mm? You're to always live as unto Christ. Because mm, I guarantee you this, when you're not in church, there's somebody watching you. Amen. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth that were written epistles known and read of all men. There's somebody watching you. Most of the time, you don't even know they're watching. Mm. People pay attention. We was down there this week, and I, I did not know this. I did not know this. Or if I knew it, I forgot it. That's what happens when you get old. Uh, the preacher got up and he was announcing about having to send out a message through the call center 
and he blamed it on me. I said, whoa, whoa, no, I didn't have nothing to do with that. He said, you had everything to do with that. Well, what I did not know is they had three ladies in their church that any time a prayer request went through, they all had to call so many people in the church. It'd take them all afternoon to call all them people to get a prayer request through. He said, but Brother Doug's the one who told me about where he could make one phone call and calls everybody. So you can thank Brother Doug. For, I did not know that he did all that. There are people paying attention whether you know it or not. There are people who ask you questions that you just think they're asking questions, but they're really trying to see your reaction to the question. You don't know how you're impacting people's lives. So you can't be double-minded. You've got to be single-minded all the time. Your mind on the Lord and the things of God. And the only way you'll keep your mind on the Lord is, again, keeping your mind focused on the, the Lord, meditating on the Lord, having a song about the Lord in your heart. How many miles has the Lord helped you down the road because you had a good song on your heart like the song these ladies sang today? Uh, but all you got to do is turn off all the things of the Lord. And I guarantee you, number one, you're going to end up far from God. Number two, somebody's going to ask you a question about the Lord, and you're not going to answer it in the right way because you've been double-minded. The last enemy that you'll deal with continually, I've referred to him the whole message, it's the devil himself. First yeah. mm -hmm. Peter 5.8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, that doesn't sound like a friend, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, a lot of people don't understand this. The devil's not in hell today. Right. Right. Ephesians lets us know that he's the prince and power of the air. Yeah. The earth is actually his domain. Yep. And he's going about trying to tempt everybody he can away from the things of God. Right. He's trying to tempt lost people to stay away from God. And he's trying to tempt Christians to get far from God so they can't lead lost people to God. Right. And so he's busy at work. Uh, now, he's not omnipresent. He's not uh, 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 everywhere all the time. He's not uh, omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. He's not omniscient. He's not all-knowing. Uh, but when he was cast out of heaven, a third of the angelic beings went with him. So he's got a lot of help. And they're busy trying to trip us up. Now, I've said this. You've got to be real careful. You've got to be real careful confessing to somebody an area you might fall short. Brother Clint, you've got to be real careful talking to Brother Eddie, your little bro literal brother, telling him, you know what, I really struggle in this area of my life. Pray for me. Now, that's a good thing to have him pray for you. But when you get into specifics, you don't know the devil might have somebody listening. Yep. Amen. Hmm? Have you ever done a search on a computer? Yeah. Search a pair of shoes? Or search a, 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 a watch or something? And then every time you search something after that, you get a pop-up of that thing you originally searched after? Yeah. You see, the computer systems of this world have alleg algorithms... Yeah. That if you look on something, then they, they, it triggers something. So then every time you look on something, that thing's going to keep coming back up. Well, the devil's got algorithms. And if he hears you've got a problem, then every time you turn around, that problem's going to keep hitting you. It's constantly going to be there. Hmm? So you've got to be real careful in confessing things. You've got to be real careful standing up in the church service when it's time for a testimony and say, Preacher, pray for me. I really struggle in this area. And name it. Because I promise you, I will try my best to pray for you, but more than that, I promise you, the devil's going to try harder to trip you up in that area. It's better just say, Hey, pray for me. I'm going through something. Now, he don't know what you're going through. Mm, but it's better to do that. I'm just trying to teach you something right here. You better be real careful when you're in your prayer closet if you pray out loud not to name what you're struggling with. The Lord knows what you're struggling with, but the devil don't till you tell him. Hmm? And see, he's an enemy who's going to constantly barrage us to the point where he'll overwhelm us 
to where we can't handle it. But I got good news. When he loads you up to all you can handle, the only place he can really drive you is to your knees. And one conversation with the Lord Jesus and helps on its way. Are you listening? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And the Lord shows up and the devil lose all sight of you. I promise you that, friend. But it's an enemy you're going to have to deal with continually. Saul, for the rest of his life, sought to kill David. Saul failed to realize who the real enemy was. Who was Saul's real enemy? Himself. Because he turned his heart from the Lord and he followed down a path he should have never went down. When we fail to seek the Lord, fail to talk with God, fail to put God first in our life, we become our own worst enemy. And all these other things I've said, they just enter in when we don't let the Lord have his way in our life. So I exhort you this morning, do what David did. Saul hunted him. What did he do? He went and found a place where, where Saul couldn't find him. Say, what did he do when he got there? He stayed there until the Lord opened the door for him to come out. You say, what happened? The Lord took care of David's enemy. And then David was installed as king. So let me help you. When trouble comes your way, get to a place where trouble can't find you. Where's that at? In the lap of the Lord. Uh, just go uh, 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 find your time with Him. Get to alone with God and open up the Word of God or get a, a good godly song on and get in your prayer closet and spend some time with God uh, and watch and see uh, if the Lord don't bless you and trouble seems to befall you and say, hey, uh, how long do I stay? You stay there till the Lord tells you to leave uh, and then when you leave, you'll find the Lord uh, has promoted you above that which was once hunting you down. My dear friends, you can't have victory in Jesus. And you can't have a victorious Christian life. Amen. You ought to live in the book of Ephesians. It's all about victory. And you can have victory today, but victory comes when you learn to put self second and Jesus first. And I highly encourage you to learn to do that because as long as you're breathing God's air, there's going to be something trying to trip you up. But I've got good news. The Lord said, with temptation, he makes a way of escape. And keep your eyes on Jesus, and you'll never fall or fail his grace to the point where you disgrace him before men. My dear friends, Saul became David's enemy continually. But it doesn't say that David launched out after Saul. He didn't. He believed God. And when God said, Touch not mine anointed, Saul had been anointed king. So David just trusted in the Lord, and the Lord took care of David's enemy. I've got good news. He'll take care of your enemies too. You might be here this morning, and something might have been pressing you or haunting you all week long. Why don't you bring it to Jesus? Get rid of it today. Maybe today the Lord's opened your eyes as to why you've been struggling. Why don't you just come and thank him and ask him to help you in that area. Maybe he showed you something else. That's what the altar's for. Maybe you're here today and your relationship with the Lord's not where it should be. Why don't you come get it where it should be? Maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with the Lord, but the Lord's been speaking your heart. You've been coming to services and he's been speaking your heart and you know you're not where you should be. You know you don't know him. Uh, why don't you come and just introduce him to him. Be the greatest day of your life, friend. Hey, even though I got, I got an enemy seeking after me, I've got a friend that's sticking closer than a brother and he has subdued all my enemies and he's been the best thing that ever happened to me and he'll be that for you as well. So we're going to have a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. You come and do business with God. Let's all stand, Brother Clint. You come, Miss Renee, you come. Say, get a song ready. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. Lord, I'm glad.
even though David had an enemy, I'm glad you had David. And God, I pray you'd help us, Lord, when we're faced with opposition, we're faced with spiritual warfare, that, Lord, you'd give victory, you'd give strength, you'd give help in due season. Now, Father, I, I feel in my spirit some been struggling with some things. I pray they get some victory over that this morning. And, God, you'd bless them real good. And, God, I pray if there's somebody that's been far from you, they'd get back in fellowship with you. And we certainly pray for somebody that doesn't know you, they'd come to trust in you. Lord, I pray your perfect will be accomplished now in this invitation. Speak to hearts and get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.